Well, hello and welcome everybody to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This week, um, we're really lucky to have with us Chris Stenson from NGINX, and he's going to be talking about implementing NGINX microservice architectures with OpenShift, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. The format for this today is that um, we'll let him do his presentation and demo and explain how it all works, and then we'll have Q&A at the end of it. So without too much further ado, Chris, go right ahead and take it away. Okay, great. Thanks, Diane. Um, so welcome to the, the briefing on uh, implementing Nginx microservice architectures with OpenShift. Um, I'm Chris Stetson. Uh, and if my slides would advance, we might be able to see a picture of me. There we go. <laughs> um, I'm Chris Stetson. Uh, I'm the chief architect uh, here at, at Nginx. I am uh, in charge of microservices and, and building out our microservices pro products and functionality. I will tell you that um, today is the day after our uh, holiday party. So if you hear my voice cracking, you'll know why. It was very loud. There was lots of dancing, and uh, I, I ended up having to shout um, in order to be heard in, in the many conversations I had. So that's the one caveat for this this presentation that I, I want to give before we get too far into it. Um, so uh, just to give a little background about me, um, I've been a developer and architect of, of web applications for the past 20 years or so. Um, I've been building large scale websites that many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, I built the first version of Sirius Satellite Radio. I built uh, Visa.com for many years. I built large parts of Intel.com, Microsoft.com, as well as, as company uh, websites like Lexus.com. I've been building uh, you know, large monolithic applications, uh, service-oriented architectures, and most recently I've been building out microservice-based systems. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is, is very much around uh, what microservices mean and how Nginx can help you build out a, a microservice application. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our history with, uh, with Red Hat and OpenShift. Um, I think it's, it is a, a relevant topic because we've watched uh, the OpenShift uh, evolution and, and where it's come, and, and we're very excited about it, particularly the, the latest uh, uh, version of it is, is really solid and has a lot of the features that we've been looking for in a, 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 a platform. Can you hear me? Um, so that was, uh, that was very Hi, exciting and, and it, hello, is, is somebody talking there? All right. I'm going to keep going. Um, a uh, little bit of, of history. I'm also going to talk about the, the, uh, major shift in architecture that microservices brings to the table. Um, uh, how you know you need to think about about applications differently in a microservice context than you do in a monolithic context, um, and what kind of, of of issues that introduces. It it definitely brings a lot of benefits, but there are things that you have to to uh, tackle in terms of of building out your applications. Uh, namely, how do you deal with service discovery? How do you deal with resource management in, in the context of, of microservices? That means load balancing. And how do you build a fast and secure network architecture to allow your, your uh, application to, to uh, communicate with itself? Um, then I'm going to go into the architectures themselves. And then finally, uh, we'll, we'll touch on some of the issues that, that, uh, you know, that you get with some of the architectures. So, There'll be a whole discussion around all of that, and then at the end, obviously, we'll be uh, we'll be talking about about uh, or answering your question. So hopefully, that all makes sense. Um, so let's dive in. All right, a bit of history. Um, <clears throat> Red Red Hat has been delivering uh, on the microservices platform for a while. Um, we worked with uh, a very early version of of OpenShift um, when it was using proprietary cartridges. Uh, and, and we could see the, the value that, that, you know, that format was, was bringing in the kind of, of, of value that microservices uh, uh, 
delivered. And you know, we even worked on a, on an Nginx cartridge for the the uh, early early version of of OpenShift. Um, last year, we ported our reference architecture that we've been building here uh, at Nginx onto OpenShift three, and uh, we were actually very impressed with the system and how it it delivered on on a lot of the management features and gave a real context to how to put together a, a, a microservice application. Um, and we liked the fact that it was it was uh, really built around Kubernetes. Um, but more importantly, we were very impressed with the vision that it articulated and and the way that even if you know a number of the features were were kind of uh, held back by legacy features uh, Issues we can see that that it was you know the very beginning of of the journey and and really that the vision was was all there. And with the OpenShift 3.3, we feel like like it really delivers on the vision. It's a very clean implementation of the core componentry. It's got a very robust security model, which is really nice. It, it you know particularly as as uh, for enterprise customers, that's a, a critical feature, and, and being able to manage that very specifically is, is is good. It really fills the gaps that you know where Docker and Kubernetes ha still have some some loose areas, um, and it it fully exposes the Kubernetes API in ways that we were able to take advantage of in order to implement our three architectures, specifically the proxy model, the router mesh, and the fabric model. So I will go into all of those uh, in a little bit, but let's first talk about, about microservices and what that means in terms of architecture. So I call this the big shift. Um, you know, the diagram that you see uh, in front of you is, is a context diagram of the classic monolithic application. You know, it's a, it, in this case, it's a, an Uber-like app you have uh, all of the functional components of your, your application, the passenger management, the billing, the notification payments, all of that running in a single VM on a single large host, um, communicating with, with all the components within that, that host using uh, uh, pointers or, or object references or, or some, some manner, and they all work together. Occasionally, they will reach out to, uh, to other services like Twilio for for notification purposes or Stripe for uh, for payment gateway, but for the most part, the entire application runs within that single host, uh, within that single VM, and 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 manages all of the data and, and interconnectivity within that that system. If you com compare and contrast that to a, a microservice version of the application, you see that that all of the components have shifted out from being on that single host to running in containers, uh, all talking to each other via RESTful APIs, um, and having that connectivity happen within the, the uh, or, or the communication happen over a, an HTTP connection between the different services. There's a lot of benefits to this, and I, you know, I, I think it's important to reiterate the the real benefits that you derive from microservices, specifically um, the, the boundary isolation that, that each of the components get, that's, it's very clear where, where one bit of code stops and, and another bit of code starts. Um, you also have the ability to very easily do uh, deployments of, of core components of the, the application without having to redeploy the entire thing. So you could, rev the passenger management component or the payments component without impacting the other components on uh, that are running your application. Um, it also gives you uh, an asymmetric scalability uh, component or a, a, an, an allowance to do uh, asymmetric scaling. So for example, if you had a surge of passengers, you could scale up your, your passenger management uh, microservice very easily without having to impact the other parts of, of your application that aren't being utilized. Obviously, in a monolithic application, if you had a surge of, of passengers, you would have to scale up the entire application, which is a much bigger and harder thing to do. Um, but it does introduce some, some, some challenges, and we'll be talking about those in a little bit. 
Now, I do have a deep, dark secret. Um, and that is that, that uh, I used to work at Microsoft um, and built and used .NET applications and built some, some very large applications for them. Um, specifically, uh, I wrote, uh, I built their Microsoft's video publishing application called Showcase. Um, it was a, a restful .NET monolith. Um, we started out as a, you know, as a single monolith and decided that, that you know, as it became more popular, we would uh, shift it into a SOA-based architecture. So splitting out different components of the, the application and, and put it, pushing them across the, the network and allowing them to communicate that way. Um, and, and for the most part, that was pretty easy. Uh, one of the, the nice things about the .NET framework um, is that, that Visual Studio actually allows you to um, almost flip a switch and change your, your DLL calls to being RESTful API calls. And so we were, at, you know, we, we made that change. We were going through the process of refactoring the code. That took a couple of weeks, but it was, it was not really that painful. Um, and, and we were pretty surprised and happy with how things were going. Uh, and it was moving along really smoothly until we put our system onto our staging site where we had uh, actual uh, client data running on the, the uh, or, or production data running on the staging server. Um, and suddenly our most popular pages, pages that, that were hosting videos uh, like, like the uh, Microsoft Word tips and tricks videos, um, those pages were suddenly taking over a minute to render. They, in the past, you know, they, they were, they had taken four to five seconds to render. Now they were taking over a minute and we were dumbfounded and, 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 you know, really concerned about this, this and realized we could not, you know, push to production with that kind of performance. Um, as we dug into it, what we discovered is that that the community server that we were using, um, Telligent Community uh, was the, the name of the system, um, was doing something that was causing the, the system to run really slowly. It was uh, it said that it was RESTful and, and that it, it uh, used RESTful API uh, uh, protocols, but it was it it. Literally, what they'd done is is simply use the the switch in uh, Visual Studio and not really optimize the system at all. And what we discovered was that that for our most popular pages, where we had literally thousands of comments and thousands of of users who were were you know talking about and and, and discussing the video that that we were delivering for Microsoft, that those pages were were having significant problems because of all the restful loops that they were doing. What we discovered was that that in the comments, the pages were being rendered with with user IDs. And those user IDs uh, would have to would be populated by a loop that would go through, take the user ID, call back to the user manager, which was on another server, populate the ID and then iterate through the entire page. And where we had thousands of comments on a page, which we did for our most popular pages, the system would go through a tight loop and populate across the network and populate the system. Um, and that, what, 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 that was what was causing our one to two minute rendering time to occur. We did a lot of, of work to mitigate that problem. We grouped the requests, we cached the data, we did, you know, we did what we could to optimize the network. And, and uh, there was, you know, we were dealing with IAS, so there was only so much we could do. Um, honestly, if we'd had Nginx, we probably could have, have speeded up quite a bit more, but it was, it was you know, at a time when, when uh, IAS was the only game in town for, for .NET applications. In the end, we were able to get it to to uh, a acceptable speed and and delivered it. But it, it for me, it was one of those moments, those searing moments, when I became very very aware of the difference in performance that you get 
from having components that talk to each other in memory versus talking to each other in, uh, in across the network. And it really forced me to think about how you architect an application so that it works properly uh, and efficiently over a network connection as opposed to an in-memory connection. <clears throat> so what does all that mean for microservices? Well, um, with microservices, you're essentially taking this, this SOA I architecture that we, we built there and, and putting it into hyperdrive. Um, all of the objects that, that are within your application are, are going to be talking to each other over the network. And they're going to be using HTTP for that data exchange. Um, and obviously, from, from Nginx's perspective, that's a good thing. We, we think you know, that, that gives us a lot, of, uh, a lot of ability to help you manage that, that communication process. Um, and it gives us, uh, uh, and you can utilize all the features and functionality within Nginx to take advantage of that. You know, and, and Nginx is very, has been part of the microservices movement from the beginning. Um, we are the, the number one uh, application downloaded off of Docker Hub right now. Um, the only two uh, uh, items that are, are, are downloaded more than, than Nginx are CentOS and Ubuntu. Um, we, uh, our, the largest microservices application uh, uh, delivery systems on the planet, Airbnb, Netflix, um, uh, Uber, all use Nginx throughout their infrastructure to help them manage their HTTP traffic. And, and we have been working very diligently internally on, uh, on microservices as well. We've built a very robust uh, uh, reference architecture that we call the Ingenious Photosite. It's essentially a, a photo sharing application um, that uh, uses uh, that uses Docker containers for all of the core components of the application. Um, we built it using uh, all the different languages that, that you could use because we wanted to not ground ourselves in any particular language or or, or uh, uh, system. We wanted to show that that our solutions worked with whatever type of language uh, that you were building with. Um, so we have. We have Python, we have Ruby, we have Node.js, we use Java, PHP, all of the different languages that are popular with, with our customers out there. We built uh, the system on top of that. Um, we also uh, use a 12-factor app, uh, uh, app design for the, the application. Um, so our containers are stateless and ephemeral. Uh, they use attached resources as, as an approach to manage data, and, and it allows us to scale and, and, and manage our containers in whatever way makes sense within the context of the application system. Um, <clears throat> and while uh, we have been working with microservices for a while, we're also good at traffic management. And this, this architectural change has really introduced you know, the advantages that I talked about before in terms of scalability and in terms of, of deployment, um, but it also introduces some, some uh, challenges. And when you look at, at the, when you compare it especially to the, the application framework of, of a monolithic application, you run it, you can recognize some, some issues, some things that we call the networking problems. And specifically, it's around, uh, uh, service discovery, it's around resource management, or in, in this case, load balancing, and then how to tackle that, that performance and security problem that, that uh, I, you know, uh, on a personal experience was very searing for me. So let's talk about service discovery to start with. And, and I think it's always good to, to compare and contrast uh, you know, a microservice architecture to a monolithic one because that's one that, that every developer is familiar with. So when you are working in a, in a monolithic application and you have one object that wants to talk to another, the VM takes care of all of that, that communication protocol for you. You know, if it, you, you, when you create the, the new object, you can just call the method and the, 
the VM will handle the, the pointer reference or the, the, the uh, object reference uh, communication between the two objects, and you don't have to worry about it. In microservices, it is not nearly as clean. Um, uh, you have to have a, a much more uh, uh, aware system to, to make that service discovery process happen. Um, typically, there is a service registry of, of one sort or another. You know, in the case of, of, of Kubernetes, it's typically etcd, um, and it is a, uh, it's a, uh, a database, essentially, that, that contains all the information about your, um, your uh, uh, services that are, are running uh, and, and available, what the, the IP addresses of those services are, and what the port numbers are if they're running without an overlay network. The second issue that, that microservices introduces, you know, again, in comparison to, uh, to microservices or uh, in a, a monolithic application is how do you utilize your resources effectively? Um, you know, it, you want to be able to, if you have three instances of, of a, shopping, uh, a shopping cart uh, instance, you want to be able to distribute your your request to those those different instances of the shopping cart uh, using uh, the the resources of the application uh, most effectively. So you want to be able to to you know distribute them between the three. You want to distribute them to the one that's responding the fastest. You want to distribute them to the one that is is closest to the object that's calling it. And you want all of that that to to do it in, you know effectively and transparently for you. Um, but you also want the developer to be able to configure the the load balancing mechanism to match the 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 uh, profile of what their system needs. So, for example, if you have a stateful service that you need to connect to, you want to have a stateful load balancing uh, scheme that you can take advantage of. So, all of these things are are very important in in being able to utilize your resources effectively in a microservice application. And then the third issue is 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 security and performance. Um, and, and you know, as I mentioned before, the the issue of of secure of, of performance is one that that is you know always present in my mind in terms of of designing a a, a microservice application, being able to to very effectively and quickly utilize. Your your resources and your your services so that that you can respond quickly to a request is really critical. The flip side of 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 that, and, and I think we've we've been able to to um, do that effectively, you know, uh, and, and do it easily. Um, but the flip side of that is that that uh, you are exposing all of your data across the network, um, you know. Uh, microservices typically use HTTP and uh, JSON packets as the the payload for for data being transferred between different systems. And that you know, if you're able to tap into a network into the network of your microservices application, you could listen in and hear all of the 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 uh, data of your application being transported and be able to read it fairly easily. Um, for some you know, types of applications that is an unacceptable risk for your your system, and so the solution, of course, is to add SSL encryption for the the communication between the um, the different services that you have in place. The problem is that that uh, SSL really exacerbates the performance issue that that you know you've been trying to mitigate and working very hard to. To uh, to overcome just in the architecture of the system, um, as you can see on the the diagram, we we have sort of a a, a, a uh, an archetype of or a, a prototype of what a service call looks like with uh, you know between two two microservices using SSL as the the protocol for communication, and essentially what happens is the Java service um, would be uh, uh, creating an HTTP client 
that would go to your service registry and uh, using the DNS and, and request an IP address of one of the user manager instances that it wants to talk to. It would get back that, that IP address. It would create, it would start the SSL handshake process, which is a, a nine step process to fully complete the, the, the key exchange. Um, it would then make the request to the, <coughs> excuse me, the user manager, get the response back, consume that data, uh, close the connection and garbage collect that HTTP uh, client that it created. And for every request to the user manager or any other service that it was doing, it would go through that same process uh, in order to get that data. Um, and that's a fairly intensive CPU intensive process, and it's a, a you know it adds many hundreds of milliseconds to the the uh, request process, you know, and and especially as you start having a deep call chain, that becomes a significant problem. So we think that we have solutions that address all three of these networking problems. Specifically, um, we have a solution that is 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 very focused on, on answering how to do really robust service discovery. Uh, we have a, the, the, our architectures address the, the load balancing issue and how to utilize your resources effectively. And we have a solution for really improving the performance of, of the encryption process so that, that you get a 77% increase in, in performance uh, when using our architecture versus a straight SSL solution. So let's get into the architectures. Um, we've come up with three different models, and uh, these architectures are not mutually exclusive. In fact, you know there are good reasons for mixing and matching them. Um, uh, the three models that that we're going to be talking about are the proxy model, the router mesh, and the fabric model. The fabric model is the most complex of the three and uh, kind of puts load balancing on its head. So we're gonna spend probably the majority of our time uh, addressing that, but um, they are all very robust and, and different UK use cases uh, really deliver on, on those, those uh, different use cases require different models and, and you know, uh, depending on what you need to do, we think that, that at least one of them will, will satisfy your needs. All right, so the first one is uh, the proxy model. And this, this uh, model very much reflects the way that, that most people use Nginx within their, their application. Um, and, and a lot of people use Nginx in this capacity with monolithic applications as well. Essentially, it's the idea of putting Nginx in front of your application to deal with, uh, with inbound uh, internet traffic. Um, the Nginx instance in this, in this case could do things like, like SSL termination, traffic shaping and security. It could provide ca a caching layer to improve the performance of your application. Um, uh, many of our customers use Nginx open source. We also have our, our Plus product, which provides you with, with things like robust load balancing uh, and, uh, and a, a better ability to do dynamic service discovery. Um, uh, which is very valuable, particularly for microservice applications where you are scaling the individual services uh, up and down, uh, you know, and, and having a, a uh, changing pool of, of, uh, of applications as, as the, the system needs to respond to different levels of traffic and, and different uh, types of, of, uh, of requests that are coming in at any given time. Um, uh, and and OpenShift is is really designed around this because it uses Kubernetes. There's the Ingress controller uh, model, which which we have a solution around, and I'll be talking about that a, a little bit more in a couple of minutes. Um, so again, the proxy model is really focused on on dealing with internet traffic. Um, you can think of it kind of as a shock absorber for your application. Uh, and with our, our Nginx Plus commercial product, we have the ability to do that dynamic connectivity back to your, your uh, ever-changing pool of microservice applications. Um, 
when we have been working, you know, we've been working with with OpenShift uh, 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 3.3 and and have been able to actually implement all three of 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 these models with uh, OpenShift. And, and I want to take a moment to to talk about how we did that. Um, so uh, uh, with the reference architecture, we have a, a proxy model uh, system um, that is kind of an ingress controller abstracted, uh, an abstracted ingress controller uh, functionality. Um, for our, uh, our application, for our reference architecture, um, we have included uh, authentication in it, so it has an OAuth agent that does authentication for for all of the traffic coming in and, and uh, attaches a, a um, authentication token to the, the request so that, that as it's passed down the, the stack, um, the person and, and user is identified through the system. Uh, unfortunately, Kubernetes does not support, uh, support authentication right now, so our proxy model uh, is not, uh, it doesn't fit into the Kubernetes uh, ingress controller format. However, Nginx does have a, a an ingress controller uh, system that that we have open sourced and made available. Um, you can download it uh, off of our GitHub account. Um, I believe it's Nginx uh, at the Nginx repo um, ingress controller, uh, and we have both a a an open source version as well as the Nginx Plus version, uh, which provides some some extra features that that you can take advantage of. Um, some things to know about uh, the the OpenShift Ingress Controller implementation: um, it does require you to to play around with the uh, with the permissions. Um, as I mentioned before, one of the things that that we really like about OpenShift is it has a more robust security model than than standard uh, uh, than the standard uh, Kubernetes system, but um, that also poses some challenges in terms of of what applications and what what parts of your application get access to the the uh, the API and because of that um, we are going to be publishing a, a blog post around uh, utilizing or, or implementing the ingress controller within openshift so uh, so know that that we will be uh, will be giving you some information about how to implement that for your systems on openshift all right. So one of the things about the, the the proxy model is that it is very focused around that that edge routing scenario, the use case of of dealing with internet traffic coming into your uh, to your microservices application, and it doesn't really concern itself with how your microservices talk to each other. Uh, starting to get my my hoarse voice again. Um, so. Uh, uh, the router mesh model is really focused around uh, trying to provide a more robust uh, system for managing your your inter internal traffic. Um, we do recommend that you have some sort of, of uh, edge routing management system, so a proxy model like system uh, to to deal with with internet traffic. But then within your your uh, uh, application, we have built out a, a what we call the router mesh, and it works um, in uh, the capacities where each of the services calls the um, the router mesh to distribute requests between the different applications or the different services that you have available. So in this diagram here, you if the pages uh, uh, microservice needed to talk to service two, it would Make a request to the the router mesh that would um, uh, be able to call the the different instances of service two and do things like properly load balance it, uh, do things like like cache some of the data, um, and and even provide features and functionality like uh, like uh, the circuit breaker pattern, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the router mesh. Uh, is is a system that hooks into the Kubernetes API and monitors the, 
the uh, event stream of of service of service changes that uh, Kubernetes emits. Um, so it is it is regularly updating the the uh, services that are available and the instances that are available for each of the services. Um, and we do those, uh, you know, through an agent that's running alongside uh, within the container of of the Nginx. Uh, uh, router mesh system um, that is listening for those those systems, and then we also utilize our uh, resolver feature um, in the Nginx Plus version to dynamically make requests to each of the services that we're load balancing against to update the the pool of instances uh, on a dynamic basis. Um, this is a, a very powerful system because it, it really centralizes your your uh, request management and gives you an ability to really track the performance of the applications within your system, a centralized place for, for dealing with, uh, with all of the metrics that are coming out about the traffic in your, your application, and a, a good place to implement something like the circuit breaker pattern. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the circuit breaker pattern, uh, it is a, a pattern that uh, uh, that is designed to um, to really provide resilience within your application. Uh, it, it utilizes active health checks to to check the the health of of your uh, microservices to make sure that they are are available and ready to respond. And the one of the advantages of using active health checks is that that it allows your microservices to do an introspective uh, analysis of of whether or not they are in a healthy state rather than waiting for for the the service to actually fall over and die which is what most uh, which is what most uh, uh, passive health check monitors do they they don't have an ability to to uh, analyze uh, the the individual uh, health elements of of the application um, if you have uh, a, a, you know, an, a service instance that is, is unhealthy, um, the router mesh can do things like route uh, requests to other services it, itself. It can also do retry, use retry logic to, to uh, you know, retry the, the connection uh, as, it, as it becomes available. And in the worst case scenario, we can provide cache data, even if the entire service is down, um, we can we can uh, continue service continuity by by using old stale cache data that's available for um, particularly for read type services. That's a very valuable uh, feature. So, um, for example, in our reference architecture, we have a, a, uh, a content service that provides data for for to fill some of the pages on our our, our uh, application. And that service um, can die all together, and we can continue serving up the pages because we have that, that content cached at the router mesh level. So as I said, uh, it really um, gives you robust service discovery, and I'll talk about that mechanism shortly. Um, it, it allows you to utilize all of the advanced load balancing features within, uh, within Nginx. Um, Rather than just your simple uh, round robin system, it can it can take advantage of, of more robust um, things like uh, like least connection or least time uh, 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 load balancing, and it it will allow you to uh, to implement the circuit breaker pattern. In terms of the OpenShift implementation, um, it has a Kubernetes event listener uh, and. Uh, it again ties into the the Kubernetes API to to get the service information and the uh, the instance information from Kubernetes. Um, for each of the services that you want to load balance, you will need to add a, uh, a an lb underscore service environment variable so that that we can know which services you want to utilize. Um, each service needs to be implemented as a Kubernetes service. Uh, so, you know, in the type definition, you need to say service. Um, and uh, like 
like the ingress controller, it needs to have uh, privileged uh, access to the, the API. So you need to, to play around with the um, with the, the permissions model in order to give the router mesh that capability in order to, to work within uh, your OpenShift system. All right, so the final model is what we call the fabric model. And like the other two uh, models that I've, I've talked about, um, it really it, uh, you know, benefits from having a, a proxy model-like system uh, in front of the, the, the application to handle that incoming uh, HTTP, HTTP traffic. Um, where it differs from the other models is that, that uh, instead of having a centralized uh, load balancing system, what we've done is pushed load balancing down to the container level so that, that each of the containers has an instance of, uh, of Nginx Plus, in this case, um, managing all of the traffic uh, that is both for, uh, coming in and going out of the HTTP, uh, of the container using HTTP. Um, the big benefits that you get from, from this are, you know, a robust uh, service discovery model, really powerful load balancing features, but most importantly, you get high performance and encryption uh, automatically within your system um, so that, that you can have a very high performance, uh, stateful encrypted network within your uh, OpenShift application. So I always find it's it's useful to go back to this this diagram to talk about the the process again. So um, you know let's let's go through that process of of where the investment manager instance up, up at the top needs to talk to the uh, user manager instances, one of the user manager instances down below. Um, you know in this case the the Java service would create an HTTP client. The client would then do a, uh, a, a DNS request to the service registry and ask for an IP of one of the, the uh, user managers. Um, the, uh, the service would, would, the registry would respond with, with the IP address. The HTTP client would go through the SSL, the nine step SSL key exchange process to establish the SSL connection. It would make the, the request it would get the response, it would close down the, the connection, it would garbage collect the HTTP client, and it would go through that process for every single request that you, uh, that you have for uh, your microservice application. Um, in the Fabric model, you can see that, that having Nginx Plus in each of the, the systems changes around the way that the, the, the uh, communication between the systems works. And, and I'm gonna go into detail on how all of this, this happens uh, in just a sec. So here you have that same Java service. Um, and it is, instead of talking to the user manager or even the service registry, it's talking only to, to Nginx Plus here. When it creates a, an HTTP client, it talks to local host and a, uh, a route that would be you know, user-manager um, within the Nginx Plus uh, instance, and, and Nginx Plus would manage that connection to all of these systems. Instead of having that, that service discovery process happen, what, what we have is Nginx Plus has a, a resolver uh, feature within its, its application, uh, within the application that runs asynchronously and is regularly checking the, the service registry for all instances of the, the user manager and adding and subtracting those from the load balancing pool um, uh, on a regular basis, so it doesn't need to it, it doesn't need to make a request to the service uh, registry every time the Java service wants to make a, a, a request to a user manager. It only needs to do it, you know, every three seconds or so. 
So you reduce the load actually that that you're uh, hitting the service registry and getting that that uh, DNS information um, for. Uh, it also um, because it has all the information about the the uh, instances, it can make a much more intelligent decision about how to load balance the request. Um, and one of my favorite uh, 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 load balancing schemes for microservices is to use the least time connection uh, uh, load balancing scheme. In least time, the the nginx plus instance uh, evaluates which which instance uh, in the load balancing pool is responding the fastest and it will will skew the the request sets to the the instance that is responding the fastest all the time doing a, a moving average of which instance is responding the fastest um, this has a benefit of also sort of biasing the request chains to, to instances that are, are local to the system. So if you have large, uh, large systems that, that are the hosts for your Kubernetes application, for your, your OpenShift application, um, many times your instances of your microservices will be on the same, uh, on the same host. And the least time connection will will bias towards those those instances because it's always evaluating the response rate of the the system. Finally, um, Nginx Plus because it's talking to another instance of Nginx Plus Plus, which is always uh, uh, running at, you know on each of the containers, it can create a a uh, connection to the Nginx Plus instance, between Nginx Plus instances, using Keep Alive D, it can maintain that connection and reuse that, that connection over and over for all of the requests between uh, the Java service and the PHP service so that, that you don't have to reuse the, uh, the, you don't have to recreate the SSL key exchange process over and over. Um, in our tests, we found that there was a 77% increase in connection performance because of that. Obviously, you can also build in the, the circuit breaker uh, uh, functionality with that, that uh, with the instances of, of Nginx Plus using active health checks. Um, we have that retry uh, ability and caching logic um, we also have a, a much more uh, robust um, uh, ability to, you know, to deal with service failure. So, you know, if you have uh, alternative um, <coughs> uh, service options, or you really understand the uh, the the failure profile of the services, you can build in things like like rate limiting. You can build in things like um, like backup uh, uh, service options as to what you want to do in case the uh, service is unavailable. So there's a lot of power and flexibility in terms of, of how you implement the circuit breaker pattern within the fabric model, as well as within the, the router mesh model. So the fabric model provides robust service discovery, as I described, um, very advanced load balancing features. Uh, you can build in the, the circuit breaker pattern, and most importantly, um, you get high performance SSL, a stateful SSL network within your, your environment, uh, within the application. <coughs> In terms of, um, of how we implemented this within, uh, within OpenShift, <coughs> each application uh, needs to run as a Kubernetes service. Um, we found that that naming the ports uh, within the the uh, the YAML file was very beneficial because um, it it helps you if, for example, you want to run uh, uh, most of your services over HTTP, but you want to have some sort of of access for health checks or something with uh, on HTTP. HTTPS is where you, your uh, application runs, but you want to have some sort of, of uh, health check for HTTP, you can name the ports and, and utilize that in the service discovery process to get back you know, both the, the 
uh, port, the port number and the, the IP address. Um, the implementation, you know, proved to be uh, very, very clean for us in terms of implementing the, the fabric model and, and we were able to get, you know, some very good performance out of it. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that there are some uh, 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 issues with implementing um, the fabric model. The first, of course, is that, that Docker recommends that you use one service per container. Um, the idea here is that, you know, you should not have uh, multiple things running in a container. You don't want to. You don't want it to be a VM. Um, you want to keep your Docker images uh, simple. More importantly, it means that that application failure within the container means container failure as well. Um, but Docker recognizes that there are a lot of instances where where this this doesn't apply and and, and is very uh, restrictive in terms of of what you need to do in order to implement your application. So it is only a recommendation. Um, we have have worked really hard uh, to to try and keep this as simplified as possible, and in fact have come up with a solution where process failure of either your application code or nginx causes the the container to failure as well so you get that that close association between container failure and uh and application failure uh within the fabric model as as we built it finally uh, you know and i think this is this is the other the other issue is that that um uh adding you know using the fabric model you do add uh, another layer to the the stack um it does provide a lot of power to the development team, uh, you know, and we think that that for for companies that uh, you know or organizations that need to have uh, encryption within their system, it really provides you with with high performance, and, and you don't have to sacrifice any of that performance in order to to really make your application secure. Um, and we've built out a, a bunch of tooling to make this this process simpler and and uh, uh, not have to force you to go through all the complexities of of implementing uh, reverse proxy SSL settings within the Nginx configuration. We have a um, a configuration generation tool where you essentially have to define your your service endpoints in a YAML file, and we will do all the rest of the work for you. So that's my presentation. Uh, thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? Well, um, you did an awesome job and you didn't lose your voice. So I, I'm pretty impressed with that. Um, we're almost at the end of the hour too. There haven't been any questions in the chat, which means you've done an awesome job or you've stunned and amazed everybody. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, one, you mentioned a couple of times that you're you're writing a blog. Is there a link or anything to some reference documentation on your OpenShift implementation that you have today to share? Uh, we we have the old blog post that we did for the original um, implement, implementation that was on OpenShift three. Um, uh, That's that up. is and that is that is up. Um, I, you know. Given everything that that we've seen in 3.3, I think we're going to be revisiting that and and updating the 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 blog post because 3.3 really delivers on the vision and, and you know allowed us to, to implement all of the you know the router mesh, the the fabric model as well as the uh, the English controller. So expect to see more blog posts from us um, shortly. Uh, all right. We've we've really been enjoying working with it. All right. Well, um, let's see if there's any. What else? So there's one question coming in from Aresh. I understand Nginx Plus is the commercial offering from Nginx, which supports running Nginx within containers. Is the Nginx Plus implementation closed source? What are the benefits over HA proxy together with console or OpenShift internal capabilities? That, uh, that's a good question. Um, and, and yes, the you know particularly for the fabric model, um, Nginx Plus is is uh, is Required, for, you know, in order to make the the system work uh, effectively, and the the biggest feature that we have in in Nginx Plus, and it is a a, a commercial closed source implementation of Nginx. Um, the feature that 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 really makes the the fabric model work, excuse me, is the resolver feature, and that 
That's the ability for Nginx Plus to do that service discovery against the DNS and change the load balancing pool of the uh, instances that we're connecting to dynamically so that it is, it is regularly responding to changes within your environment. Um, uh, the, um, a, a, as opposed to HA proxy, the, the things that, that we, we bring are our um, uh, uh, resolver is much more robust than the one in HA proxy. HA proxies, uh, it, it, honestly, it looks like they've, they've deprecated its functionality. Um, they never implemented the SRV record uh, capability, which is something that, that we use extensively and is the reason that you do that, that uh, port naming uh, recommendation that I, I provided. Also, HA proxy does not allow you to implement the, the uh, circuit breaker pattern within the, the uh, application. So um, that's, the, that's the downside of, of, of uh, using HA proxy. Those are the downsides of using HA proxy and some of the benefits that you get from Nginx Plus.